Psalm 19 for the Director of Music, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Please do keep your Bibles open at Psalm 19. Does God still speak? I grew up hearing testimonies about it, but until October 2005, I couldn't say it had ever happened to me. I'm a middle-aged professor of theology at a well-known Christian university. I've written 10 award-winning books. If you're in doubt that this is not me, this is a quote from someone else now. For years... I've taught that God still speaks, but I couldn't testify to it personally. I still can't talk or even think about my conversation with God without being overcome with emotion. That was the introduction to an anonymous article that was published in Christianity Today. It appeared on the website on March the 2nd, 2007, and it was called My Conversation with God. The author goes on to write about God speaking to him, apparently, as you've heard for the very first time. He heard God telling him to give a significant amount of money to a student in need. Now, I'm sure that was a good thing to do, and I've got no reason to disbelieve that what he says happened. Uh, but I think that those words are incredibly sad to read, because it raises the question of whether this anonymous, award-winning theological professor has ever read the Bible. Now, I'm sure he has, but I'm equally convinced that he's not properly understood Psalm 19. Because in Psalm 19, we see that God speaks through his word. C.S. Lewis loved Psalm 19. He was an expert in all forms of literature, so we should listen to his opinion. Here's what he said. I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. And he's read a lot more lyrics than any of us have, I would imagine. Psalm 19 is a love poem. I hope you heard that as Agnes read it. It was a love poem written by David, but it's not about a stunningly beautiful woman or even about a spectacularly incredible sunrise. It's about the Bible. And as we read David's love poem about the Bible, we see that he's very different from the anonymous author in Christianity today. David was a person who showed his emotions easily, and it all comes flooding out here in this psalm. But what is it that gets David so excited? It's that God speaks to him through Scripture, regularly, constantly, normally. 
David doesn't just teach the truth that God speaks. He experienced it personally. Now you know that this summer we're looking at some psalms. That's not because loads of people are away, and so it doesn't matter what we do in late July and early August. Our series is called, You Are the God Who Saves Me. That comes from the very first verse of Psalm 88. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. In Psalm 88, we saw the psalmist on their own in the dark. Last week in Psalm 130, we saw the psalmist on their own in the depths. In this series, we're looking and spending some time where we see the psalmist speak as an individual, maybe at a time when they're on their own. And we've seen already how their faith has lived out in those difficult situations. Well, this morning we'll see that David's not in the dark. In fact, he's in bright sunshine. We'll see that in a second. And he isn't in the depths. In fact, he's, he's in the heights. But just look at the end of the psalm in verse 14. See that he ends the psalm with a necessary individual response to God's word that is essential for us to embrace in our personal walk as a Christian. Firstly, this morning, in verses 1 to 6, we hear the sky speak. And it says, glory to God. Now, have you ever been in the Sistine Chapel? I won't ask for a raise of hands because then everyone else will get jealous. It is breathtaking. You can be jealous of me if you want. The rooms leading to it have all of these stunning frescoes. And you can't really imagine that anything's going to get better. And it keeps on building up. And then you enter the room. It took Michelangelo over four years to create. It really is the most magnificent piece of art that I've ever seen. Giorgio Vasari was a contemporary of Michelangelo. Here's what he said. When the chapel was uncovered, people from everywhere rushed to see it, and the sight of it alone was sufficient to leave them amazed and speechless. People just standing, staring. Michelangelo was only 37, but his reputation rose such that people called him Il Divino. Even in Italian, you know that's quite good, right? The divine one. Now imagine that you're standing there in the middle of the Sistine Chapel and you're looking up at the splendor above you. And you overhear an art critic giving a lecture. He begins by spending five minutes commenting on the fading pigment of the paint that Michelangelo used. Then he spends ten minutes explaining that the artist used archaic brush strokes. And finally... The last 15 minutes are giving over to discussing the dispute over payments between Michelangelo and Pope Julius II. Now, the lecture might well be interesting. All of those things are true. But I don't think that's why anyone goes to the Sistine Chapel. Even as he's speaking, if you were standing there, your eyes would have been lifted up to scan the 300 figures and all of the biblical scenes. You came to see the work of the divine one. Well, if the lecturer is missing the point of being in the Sistine Chapel, David does not want us to miss the point of creation. So he begins this psalm in verse 1 by saying, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Every single day, when you open up the curtains, you see the work of the divine one. The sky speaks. And it says, glory to God. Just look at verses 1 to 4. David continues to personify the sky. He says it pours forth speech and reveals knowledge. He says it has a voice and uses words. These first four verses are all about the sermon of the skies. And its message, they're screaming. I was created by the divine one. Give glory to God. Maybe you have a particularly beauty spot that speaks to you. It might be the Langdale Heights. Many of our friends are in Keswick right now. They might be going to Derwent Water today and looking up the Borrowdale Valley. Yesterday, we were driving down the road to Haversage and just past Surprise View as we turned around the corner. We just caught sight of the whole of the Polk Valley. 
I'm sure we've all had moments when we've just been astounded at the beauty and the intricacy and the enormity of nature. But well, that's what David experiences here. He asks us to look, look at the sky. Look at what he says. Whether it's daytime or nighttime, every passing moment of all has been revealed that there is a big and the goodness of his glory. God spoke it all into existence. And it now speaks of his creative work and power. Think back to Genesis 1. So much of Genesis 1, the creation account, is about the sky. Let me just read you a few verses. uh, Verses 14 to 16. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. Look up at the sky and you'll hear it speak. In our Milky Way, there are 100,000 million stars. Uh, Scientists have estimated conservatively that there are one quadrillion stars in the universe. That's one of those numbers that you can't tell how many football pitches that would fit in, is it? Apparently that's one with 24 zeros after it. I just can't comprehend it. And Genesis 1 says, simply, he also made the stars. During the French Revolution, a revolutionist named, I wish Del was saying this word, Jean Bon Saint André, apparently, he said to a peasant, I will have all your steeples pulled down so you no longer have any object to remind you of your old superstitions by which he meant God. The peasant looked at him and quietly replied, I take it you'll be leaving the stars behind. Plutarch was a Greek philosopher. He said the world resembles a divinity school in that everything it teaches us about God. Well, David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. As you look up, hear the sky speak, and it says, glory to God. If you glance down at the end of verse 4, the last line in that verse, you'll see that David then draws our attention to one specific example, the sun. We felt the power of the sun this week, haven't we? David says, in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. If you're camping this summer, I hope you've got your pitch sorted already. Might be tight to get in if you don't. The sun has been designated a pitch by the author of life himself. In verse 5, David likens the sun to a groom just after the happiest moments of his life. Or maybe like a champion athlete. Someone who's got the speed of a sprinter and the endurance of a marathon runner. Who constantly completes the course and wins his race. The sun represents the very best of all of creation. And then look at verse 6. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The constant, dependable cycle of life-giving light and warmth preaches and proclaims God's glory. I think these six verses are reflected well in the very famous hymn. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Uh, Join with all nature in manifold witness uh, to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Uh, The sky speaks. The sermon's only got one point. Glory to God. Uh, But despite spending six verses telling us about the sky... That's actually not what David wants us to get blown away by. I hope you are. And then, in verses 7 to 11, we see the scripture speak. And they say, this is the Lord. Now, as Agnes read the passage, I hope you realize that it was a poem. Agnes read it poetically. We need to remember that because if we try and read this like a letter, we'll miss what David's trying to say. I think C.S. Lewis can help us again. He says this, The actual words supply no logical connection between the first and the second stanzas. Uh, 
a poet that passes with abruptness from one theme to another and leaves you to find the connecting link for yourself. Can you see that between verses 6 and 7? One moment, we're hearing an, an ode to the sun. And then suddenly David's talking about the law of the Lord. Some people have suggested that that means that these two parts of the Bible don't belong together. But they're wrong. Lewis continues. He says, the key phrase on which the whole poem depends is that last line of verse 6. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. It pierces everywhere with its strong, clear order. Then at once, in verse 7, he is talking of something else, which hardly seems to him something else, because it is so like the all-piercing, all-detecting sunshine. David moves from the sun's warm heat straight to the word of God, because for him, he's just reminded of one by the other. In fact, look at what he says about the law of the Lord. Aren't these descriptions reminiscent of the sun? Soul refreshing. Joy bringing. Light giving. Radiant. But alongside these similarities, there's actually something very different going on in these two stanzas. Can you look at verses 7 to 9 and notice the big difference between these verses and the first six? Just look at the name David's been using. He's been using the name God or Elohim. The same name that was used actually in Genesis 1 to describe God as the creator of all things. But then he changes in verse 7. He begins to use the personal name of the Lord. Yahweh, the covenant-making God. And would you know it, that name switch mirrors exactly what Moses does in chapter 2 of Genesis. When he moves on to descri from describing God as the creator of all things to describing the relationship that he has with Adam and Eve. The sky speaks. It really does. About God. But David wants us to see that scripture says a lot more. The sun is great. It gives life. But it is nothing compared to the Bible. As someone once said, in God's works, we see his hand, but in his word, we see his face. God's creation it does tell us so much about him. In Romans 1, Paul says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. But then in 2 Timothy 3, Paul says that only Scripture is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We don't primarily call God our creator. We call him Father. Because we have a relationship with him. Because he's our redeemer. And it's the Scriptures, as they speak, that tell us he is the Lord. Let's just spend a few minutes in verses 7 to 9. David uses five different words to describe the Bible. And each of them together contribute to this all-encompassing picture of Scripture. And he also describes its effects on people. Verse 7 is the headline. The law of the Lord is perfect. Can't get much better than that. Refreshing the soul. There's no fault in it. It's got no blemishes and it refreshes or stronger than that it revives the soul it is life-giving because dead people read God's word and they live again now the sun can't do that can it he then says in the second half of verse 7 the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy making wise the simple now Psalm 19 is the abridged version of Psalm 119 it's easy to remember them because they've both got 19 in them. My grander, when he was a young boy, his favorite verse in the Bible was Psalm 119, verse 99. And he would tell me this, Daniel, I loved it because here's what it says. If you read the Bible, you have more understanding than all your teachers. That's one motivation for reading the Bible anyway, isn't it? And my grander was just a simple man, a gardener from Glasgow. Glasgow. 
but he grew up knowing that the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. And they gave him a sure footing to live a life filled with godly wisdom. In verse 8, David continues, The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Reading God's word makes sense of life. And then living God's word brings true joy. And then David says, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. I think this helps us understand so much of what we've been hearing lately. Think about the last two weeks. With Morris in Psalm 88, we were in the dark. And last week with Dell, we were in the depths of Psalm 130. And both times, they told us, the dawn will come. Last week, in fact, in Psalm 130, we heard the psalmist say, in God's word I put my hope. The daily dawn that we see every morning is outshone by the light the Bible brings. And we've seen this in Mark 2, haven't we? Blind people seeing because they've listened to the words of Jesus. Then as David wraps up in verse 9, We see that all of this leads to the fear of the Lord, the right response to God's word. And he ends with a summary. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. Don't want you to see, don't want, do, do, (laughs) say that again, shall I? Don't you want someone to speak about you the way David speaks about the Bible? He adores it. And then he moves on from describing Scripture and its effects to explaining its value in verse 10. He says, They are much more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. It's like an M&S advert, isn't it? This is not just gold. This is precious, pure gold. This is not just honey. This is honey straight from the honeycomb. This represents the very best of the ancient world. And David says it's incomparable compared to the value of God's word. And in verse 11, we see that its value lies in the role it plays as a guide for life. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. That's the meat of David's love poem. I think we have to ask ourselves, do we love the Bible this much? Is it a joy to read it? To hear from it? Do you look forward to God speaking to you every time you open it? Does your experience match David's feelings? Do you love the Bible more than the representative examples, money and honey? Is it your greatest treasure? I think we believe that this psalm is true. It's why God's word is at the center of everything we do. It's why you're here this morning to hear from God's word. It's why we've sent Hazel Gray to Tanzania. It's why we support Tim and Nim Kempton and Joss so they can translate the Bible and people can have the most precious gift we can give them. On Wednesday night, we, we remembered that it's what the Delahoyes are doing in Paris. They don't point people to creation and say, isn't that great? They take people to the scriptures. But you know, it's not enough just to believe it. What we saw with our anonymous friend in Christianity today, he believed it, and yet he'd never experienced it. We can't just believe that God speaks. We heard last week that these truths need to actually live out in our lives. We have to experience this ourselves. And to do that, we need to read God's word. In the year 1800, a little Welsh girl called Mary Jones knew this psalm to be true. She was from a poor family family, and became a Christian when she was eight. She begged to go to school so that she could read because all she wanted to do was read the Bible. Finally, she learned, but the nearest Bible was owned by a farmer who lived over two miles away. She trekked back and forwards as much as she was allowed while saving up money 
for six years before she could buy her own. By the time she was 16, with half of her young life dedicated solely to owning and reading her own Bible, the nearest place she could buy one was in Bala. It was 26 miles away. And she walked barefoot the marathon distance through the rugged North Wales terrain for three days to purchase her treasure. Is that challenging? The only difficulty for us to read the Bible is to blow the dust off the top of it. I have a Ugandan friend called Charles O'Collar. We were colleagues for a while. When I worked for an international development charity, he was the finance director of our Ugandan work. At one time before traveling over there, I asked if I could bring his children some gifts. What would they like, I asked. He said, a Bible. I presume that was him answering, not them. I asked if they would like me to bring him anything else. He said, if you've got space, bring more Bibles. I arrived in Kampala with only a couple of t-shirts, a single pair of shorts, but enough Bibles for his wider family. He wrote to me afterwards and said it is the greatest gift he had ever received. And he was right. Because through it, God speaks. And he says, this is the Lord. Thirdly, look down at verses 12 and 13. We see the servant speak. And he says, forgive me. Having looked at the sky and then the scriptures, David looks at himself. He's reminded as he looks at God's word that he is sinful. Let me read these verses. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. As scripture speaks, it shows David his sin. David says he's not able to evaluate himself properly, and so he needs God's word to help him. Sometimes he sins without knowing it. His hidden errors need forgiveness. Sometimes he sins deliberately, and he knows that those sins have got the potential to overpower him. And what he wants is blamelessness, innocence. But he knows that what he needs is forgiveness. Just look at verses 12 and 13. The word for forgive in there is the same word used in verse 7 to describe the law of the Lord. It means to perfect or to clean. What David is saying is he wants to be like God's word. He wants to share its attributes. He wants to be as clean as it, as perfect as it, as trustworthy and right and radiant and pure and righteous as it. But he's not. And so he cries out for forgiveness. At the top of this psalm, you'll see that it's a psalm of David. But the psalms can only truly be sung by Jesus. Jesus is the true servant who who sings these words perfectly because he is the true word of God, the creator of all things and the fulfillment and the end of the law. Jesus does share all the attributes of God's word because he is the word. He's clean and perfect and trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, and righteous. John shows us this in the opening words of his gospel. In the beginning, he says, echoing Genesis 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. And it's the light of Christ that we read in the Bible. Think back to the beginning of Psalm 19. If the sun is outshone by scripture, 
But then we can see by the end that out of Scripture shines the sun. Jesus Christ. And as we read the Bible and see our own sin, we also read that it is through his law-keeping life and sin-bearing death that we can find forgiveness and gain righteousness. So finally, turn just to the last verse. The psalmist speaks as he closes, and he says, my rock and my redeemer. That's how David ends the psalm. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. These words and meditations were pleasing in the sight of the Lord. They were included in scripture for us to read. But more than that, they point us to the pleasing life and death of the Lord Jesus. It was Jesus who David looked forward to, however dimly, as his rock and redeemer. And it is because of Jesus' pleasing work that each of us can say, he is my rock and redeemer. But we only know and experience those words for ourselves by reading the Bible for ourselves, by loving the Bible for ourselves, by listening to God speak to it ourselves. And of course, we do that together on Sundays and in small groups, maybe with a friend or a spouse through the week. But do notice that David says the Lord is my rock and my redeemer. There's a moment when he stands independently. And this is a personal faith born out of a ferocious personal experience of the Lord through his word. I pray that today would be a day that our love for God's word increases. In all settings, together, for ourselves, at home, when we get up, when we're on our way to work, in the 10-minute gap that we carve out in the middle of the day. The question we started with this morning was, does God still speak? And the answer of Psalm 19 is, yes, he does. He's speaking to us now. And he's telling us to listen to his word. Because it is life-giving as it tells us about his son. My rock and my redeemer. Let's pray together. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for your word that speaks to us. We thank you that it teaches us that you are our redeemer. That we see in it who you are, the Lord. It cries out to us about the Lord Jesus. And as we're confronted with our sin in the mirror of the law, we also hear the good news of the gospel. Father, would each of us this morning be able to say that you are our rock and redeemer. May our love for your word increase. Amen.